just want to again express appreciation for for this forum, for allowing people to come together, and for allowing us to have this conservation conversation. I think uh, I think I think of the biggest take home has been that uh, it, it's what I've heard for the last several days that uh, you can accomplish a great deal in conservation if you're if you're not vying for the credit, if you don't worry about who's gonna, gonna keep score, uh, collectively, conservation can, can be very successful and be of real value to the future of where we're headed. So again, this is an outstanding opportunity. Uh, my name, Bill Bardish. Uh, I'm with the Gulf Coast Prairie Landscape Conservation Cooperative, and I'll explain a little bit more about what that is. I had the opportunity to attend the, the conference in Houston, and again, the previous conference in Kingsville, and, uh, and we have a, uh, a cooperative that's uh, very active in this landscape, and a number of the speakers this last few days have talked about the value of bringing things together. How do we have a better collective? How do we find ways to work better and communicate together? And I hope this this session will, will help in that arena. Uh, conservation cons conversation uh, will equal, I think Tony mentioned that uh, uh, community change can be enhanced by that con conservation conversation. And there are a lot of C's in there, but uh, it's, it's all about Clarity, brevity, and repetition. We have to have a clear message. We have to have a simple, straightforward message. And we have to repeat it time and time again, not only to the same audience, but as many people as we can get to. Clarity, brevity, and repetition. We need to remember that. If we're going to make a value in the future, uh, this message on, on restoring prairies, protecting prairies, maintaining that, that last part of our grassland heritage, is, is very important and we've got to get beyond our inner circle with that consistent message of clarity, brevity, and repetition. The landscape cooperatives are all about adding value. It's, it's not about creating a new initiative that's going to do something above and beyond. Our cooperative is about adding value. We're seeking a way to add value to all the excellent organizations and agencies out there today doing significant conservation work in, in our, not only in Texas, but Louisiana, Oklahoma, Kansas, uh, the Southern Great Plains, and throughout North America. We're, we're here, the Conservation Cooperative is about bringing those folks together in this conservation conversation. We talked a great deal about uh, fire uh, over the last few days. Again, that's how do we collectively bring people together to, to learn more about the value of fire and not to fear fire. Uh, instead of hosing it out, as one person said, how do we use that to our benefit? Uh, there was a discussion in one of the previous talks about geospatial information when we talked about the farm bill. Being able to tell where our grasslands are on the landscape is difficult. Most folks that use geographic information systems are stuck with the land cover, um, NLCD, the National Land Cover Data Set. And all that can do is tell you grass or not grass. It can tell you agriculture, something that's been plowed, but you can't separate pasture land uh, from tall grass prairie. It looks the same. So we have to come up with ways to use new technology to help decipher that so we can meet some of these needs of the farm bill. And, and, it, and again, uh, the last part I think Matt mentioned today, and it been, it's been brought up before in the farm bill discussion, they talked about focal areas, strategic placement of conservation is so important on the landscape. We can't put every dollar across every acre and expect this to make a difference. We have to find ways to focus our conservation. And let me see if I can uh, advance this. Should be the Should whole, be able to just the left button. The left button. There we go. Um, if we can advance conservation, uh, uh, 
we, uh, we can move forward. Established in 2011, it should be 2000, not 2001, but 2011, the concept of LCC started in, uh, in the late 1996-98 with the onset of joint ventures expanding to a broader horizon of all birds. And that joint venture concept, if you're familiar with that, uh, goes way back to um, uh, the time when uh, North America had to find ways to manage waterfowl that bred in the Arctic and Canada, came to the United States, wintered in Mexico. So how do you get multiple countries to come up with consistent regulations and habitat efforts that are will get to that conservation goal? And those joint ventures have been a successful uh, evolution of that concept of conservation. The Landscape Conservation Cooperatives, the LCCs, came about to go beyond migratory birds and look at all species, all taxa, and look at our habitats, our landscape. In the Gulf Coast Prairie, uh, it contains parts of five states and a portion of northern Mexico. And the platform we work on is sound science. We work on a platform of science so our partners that are part of the cooperative have good information, factual information, to make those hard decisions. If we are going to strategize, let's have a good reason to put a dollar here and not there. Uh, and the coordination of partner efforts is, 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 is really can't be, you can't repeat that enough. Uh, every state agency, every federal agency in Texas Every organization has ideas on how they want to protect prairies or the species that occur on those prairies, but how do we get them together to where we're not spending everybody's dollar on a parallel path? How can we intertwine that and make it a much stronger weave? How do we integrate that to find value? Again, adding value to those efforts that will make a difference across the landscape. Our, uh, current Gulf Coast Prairie Steering Committee consists of federal agencies, state agencies, and other organizations, NGOs. We mentioned, uh, I, for instance, work for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Cynthia Edwards over here works for the Wildlife Management Institute. Uh, we also have U.S. Geological Survey, the National Park Service, uh, NRCS. Uh, a number of the federal agencies, uh, including NOAA and the Army Corps of Engineers that we work with in terms of water and climate change issues, and then our state agencies, Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma. We, we connect with uh, our, our partners in Mississippi as well as, as Kansas and New Mexico as well. They don't have members on our steering committee, however, they're connected in our communication stream. And then the Conservation Fund, Ducks Unlimited, the Nature Conservancy, joint ventures three joint ventures, and two fish habitat partnerships. So, so we have 18 steering committee members that meet face-to-face -face twice a year. We have monthly calls, and we talk about how do we connect conservation across this landscape we call the Gulf Coast Prairie. A little bit more about the Landscape Conservation Cooperative uh, geography. As you can see, it's not only the North American continent, but it's, uh, it's the Pacific Islands. And this map doesn't have the Caribbean, but we have an active group in the Caribbean uh, that, that uh, eventually, we hope, will include some of Cuba, if not all of Cuba, because of the value for all the species that winter there, uh, migratory birds and fish species that will also use our estuaries in the Gulf. So, Again, the, the LCC is, is about all taxa, which includes a number of fish and, uh, and invertebrate species. Uh, shrimp, blue crabs are high on our list. So again, uh, we're looking at the entire landscape and how do we refine that. The Gulf Coast Prairie is that light blue area that, that's in circle. As you can see, we have we have an area in Louisiana that extends down to, to northern Mexico and up into Kansas. And that's considered uh, a very important part of, our, of the South Central Plains, the, the Southern Plains landscape. 
and it includes probably the most in terms of human population of all the, the plains uh, geographies. If you think about uh, northern New Mexico, the, the Valley of Texas, San Antonio up to Oklahoma City and Houston and New Orleans, we've got a, a fair number of people to deal with in our geography. There's lots of people wanting a great deal of uh, recreational land and uh, agricultural land and use of that land and how are we going to make that all fit and have conservation and valued grasslands within that geography. We work close with our, our sister landscape cooperatives. This is the Gulf Coastal Plain and Ozarks, they call it, which includes a lot of the Mississippi Alluvial Valley. I'm actually co-located in an office with those folks, so again, it, include, it improves that communication so we know what our neighbors to the east are doing. Uh, we also work closely with the Great Plains LCC. Uh, we have weekly calls and talk about how we share resources. They are working closely with us on our grassland uh, information, our tool, that, uh, our platform that Cynthia will talk about here in a minute. But, uh, but that's a little bit of an overview of what the Landscape Conservation Cooperative is and what the Gulf Coast Prairie specifically is. And, and what I'd like to do is turn this over to Cynthia, who's a lot more articulate in where we're going from the science arena in terms of my job collecting, getting people together, and having that conservation uh, conversation and coordinating those discussions among all our partners to something that's, that this group has uh, talked about for several years. When I first visited with Jaime, uh, the uh, NPAT group had a tremendous data set of inventoried areas. Uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife had a number of prairie sites. Jason Singhurst had helped coordinate inventory of these prairie areas. Other organizations had, had locations of prairie sites. Texas Parks and Wildlife was maintaining good landowner database with quality prairie remnants. But guess what? Everybody had their data sets on different platforms. Some were in files in a cabinet, some were on a computer, some were in a geographic information system, then nothing was pulled together. So one of the things that we saw was value was, uh, was trying to pull that information together. And, and that's when, when, it, when I think it's, it was appropriate Cynthia stepped in because the best I can do is write a few notes on a piece of paper. And uh, being from Oklahoma <laughs> State, we, were, we usually called that silo tech when I was going to school. So, uh, so I, I'm hoping everybody heard Sam it. Uh, Fuelendorf's talk this morning because he's one of the people that are making a, a, a difference at Oklahoma State. It's good to see folks like that here integrating with this group and with that. I'm going to turn it over to Cynthia and let her talk a little bit more about this common spatial platform and how we have organized this within the eco-regions of the Gulf Coast Prairie. Great. Thanks, everyone. And I'm suffering from a bit of a cold, so I apologize in advance. Hopefully you can hear me all right. So, so as, as Bill mentioned, uh, the LCC has been in existence for a few years now, and the kickoff to that in terms of a science, identifying the partnerships, science priorities, was a forum that was held in 2012. I think it was here in Fort Worth, actually, the Science, science Forum. forum. Uh, that was before I started. I've been on board since February of last year. Um, so this is just a slightly different map uh, highlighting some of the urban areas that we deal with that certainly came out in that science forum as one of the key stressors that this landscape is, is facing. Not to mention the, the coastal uh, issues with sea level rise and then up to some of the things we've been talking about the last few days including invasives and the uh, loss of, of native prairie. So. It's pretty um, interesting to see the number of large urban centers in this geography and even scarier are the trends and one of the presentations yesterday highlighted some of that, what it's going to look like 20, 30 or 50 years from now. So we have a, a diverse landscape and it, it part of that a diverse a number of grasslands ranging from Tamaloop and Savannah grasslands in the south uh, and in northern Mexico up to Texas blackland tallgrass prairie, uh, coastal prairies, Texas sand sheet. This is just a, a 
a example of the number of and types of grasslands we're looking at. And one of the first things that uh, that we did as a science team and we've been working on over the last year or so is looking at better defining what we mean by grasslands. So when we talk about tall grass prairie in this area and within the partnership, what, what does that include? So that, and I should mention the, so I coordinate the science team of the LCC. Bill showed some of the partners earlier. The science team has basically been appointed by those steering committee members. We have 15 official members and about five to, to 10 uh, additional people who contribute regularly. And, and I, identifying focal species has been one of our key uh, areas of uh, focus in the last year, as well as identifying broadly uh, defined landscapes and grasslands, of course, given our geography comes out as a really high priority for the, for the partnership. We focus on strategic habitat conservations that conservation, the LCCs were put in place to address issues that no single agency could really address, including things like how do you work across state lines or across federal agencies or across state agencies. And then how do you get work with the NGOs that are also involved in that? And Bill mentioned we have we work with three joint venture partners, the Oaks and Prairies joint venture, as some of you might have seen. Uh, Jim Giacomo or Ken G speak in the last day and a bit. Uh, we've got the Rio Grande joint venture on the southern part of our border and then the Gulf Coast joint venture and we're co-located with them in Lafayette actually. So. so we focus on strategic habitat conservation, that's our steering committee's uh, direction and uh, within that looking, starting to look at grassland habitats that are essential for many of our partners and how we can use focal species to indicate the health of those landscapes and population objectives primarily for grassland bird species in, in the grassland areas and begin to identify science needs that are the needs across the partnership, not necessarily sort of the ballad work of any one individual agency. And if there are questions, just stop me at any, any time as well. So as I mentioned, the, the 2012 Science Forum uh, one of the first things that came up really in that was uh, the data that Bill talked about. So everyone has their data housed in different forums and different states and at different scales and there is no way to really stitch it together. So that's one of the things I'll be talking about in a few minutes here, how we're beginning to address that. Uh, habitat management, of course, came up as a priority in that science forum, both uh, restoration and revegetation. Fire comes up again and again and has here in the last couple of days as well. And then the diversity of those areas. So we've got everything from bottom line hardwoods to riparian hardwoods, chenier forests, and all the grasslands that are connected within that. So some of those first discussions led to the development of what we're calling the, the Oklahoma Ecological Systems Mapping that's being led by Alan Janis out of Oklahoma <coughs> Department of Wildlife and Conservation. And it's really taking some of the really detailed information that we had in Texas on uh, ecological systems that Dave Diamond and his colleagues out of Missouri did and expanding that into Oklahoma. So that project is underway. They've been uh, ground truthing it over the last year and a bit and hopefully it should be wrapped up soon. So that was one of the pieces of information that was missing particularly in Oklahoma in this case. And then uh, we've got a few other ongoing uh, efforts uh, in addition to that, uh, we, what we call the Conservation Planning Atlas, which is basically our first crack at starting to put that data storage piece together for the partners that's easily accessible, that anyone could go in and look at or utilize. And that includes both information on the focal species we're working on as well as some of the other projects. Uh, the in-stream flow work on the aquatic side, for example, all of that data is going to be housed there. Most of it's, a lot of it's there already. And then you can use that to develop mapping products for your own, your own needs. And I'll show a, a slide of that in a few minutes. And then one of the other uh, initial things we did was look at inventory tools. And Ken G mentioned this in his presentation yesterday. The, uh, the Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture Partners had identified a need to have a mapping product that 
would enable them to see where their projects are on the landscape, where other people's projects are on the landscape, uh, in part in an attempt to look at some of the connectivity. So how do you build on blocks of habitat? And because no one had all their data in the same place, this is a first start for us to be able to build that. So the Grassland Restoration Incentive Program that's been discussed a little bit in the last couple days, that's some of the initial data that's gonna go into that so you can start to see patterns or blocks and other people can go in and start to build on that in terms of conservation easements or restoration and starting to build those corridors. So that's just um, underway and it's being pilot tested by the joint venture partners. So, and hopefully it'll be uh, fully operational here in the next few months. This is the, what the database and what the conservation planning atlas looks like. So as you can see, uh, this is the recently, we just put this grassland uh, working group together not very long ago. So it's got some of the maps in there, the soil survey maps, the tall grass prairie polygons. It'll include uh, some of the data from uh, the project I'm gonna talk about here in a few minutes. And it's really just a forum where people can go in and look at things, you can add your own data to it so other partners can look and see what you've got. And um, it, it's just getting underway, so hopefully it's gonna serve a really good purpose for the partners to be able to go in, look at what other people are doing, anything that's public, of course, only. Uh, you can create private sites too. If there's sensitive information, uh, you, can, you can have a lock on it. And many of the LCCs are starting to use platforms like this and those will be available to, to people across the country. So if you want more information on this, you can ask me at the end and I'll, I'll see what I can do. Our technical person, our GIS person at the Wetlands Center in Lafayette, uh, Blair Turpak, sort of manages this for us. Which brings me to the 2013 Prayer Partners meeting, which we held at the Wildlife Society uh, meeting last year in Houston. This was about two weeks after I started as a science coordinator, so my memory of that <laughs> meeting is a little fuzzy. I'll have to admit there was a lot going on and I didn't know anyone. Uh, I had just started and I came from Saskatchewan actually to Lafayette, so I was really, uh, my learning curve was about <laughs> like this. So, uh, but. We had a partners meeting at the Wildlife Society last February, and one of the needs that we talked about a lot was we need information, tools that can help us make better decisions. So we started <coughs> sketching out a decision support tool project uh, so that partners could look at things that they needed to, at, at the scale that they needed uh, to make those decisions at. As men Bill mentioned, the the NLCD, the, those types of databases are okay to look at really big picture stuff, but that doesn't help you much at a local, at a local level. So I started to talk about some of the common elements we wanted to see, and then whether, whether or not, and if so, how flexible it needed to be as well. So the partners could focus on their priorities, and of course we know there's a wide diversity of priorities, everything from education, to different species focuses, to working lands, to looking at corridors for connectivity. And we came up with uh, some novel solutions to, to those different priorities. So the action item out of that was that we needed to um, provide, start a project that would enable us to collect the information we needed from the partners to sketch out a toolkit and what that would look like. So the Grassland Decision Support Tool project was the result. It got sort of underway, I guess, uh, late last year, late last calendar year. Uh, Dave Diamond out of the Missouri Resources, I can never remember that acronym. <laughs> Assessment. Assessment Partnership. <laughs> so Dave Diamond and Lee Elliott out of uh, MORAP and Pat Comer uh, out of NatureServe are the, are the lead investigators, principal investigators in that. And the goals of it are to identify uh, landscapes of importance at appropriate scale for further work. So where do we need to work next? And then to develop the GIS data and decision support tools to facilitate that. So what is it that we need? And uh, what kind of products do we need to help us make those decisions? So over the last uh, beginning, I guess over the first two weeks of May, 
we held some partner workshops, and we put those together to solicit input on grassland types of, inter of interest to the partners, so what kind of habitat are you looking at, where are they, and what are the stressors that are facing those habitats. They're very different in coastal prairie where sea level rise is an issue versus around Houston where it may be more urbanization and in Oklahoma where it might be eastern red cedar. So there's a lot of different priorities and stressors. What types of grassland decisions are you going to make? Is it about where you need to purchase grasslands, where you need to have education facilities, where you need to save something because there's a really rare plant species? And then what are some potential pilot project sites where there's ongoing work uh, amongst the partnership where we could really test the use of the tools that we develop in the project. So we held four workshops uh, in early May. Oklahoma City was the first one. Then we came to Austin, uh, Kingsville uh, as well, and then ended up in Lafayette on the 15th of May. So we had about 60 participants uh, across those four workshops, 60 to 70. So we had a pretty good cross-section of, of people. And basically there were facilitated workshops to go through those questions. So really trying to get at what you would use a decision support tool or a series of tools to do. I'm just going to highlight a few of the uh, results that came out of those workshops. We're still working on the next steps. Uh, but this is basically a summary of, of what we heard. So in Oklahoma City, the grassland types are savannas and, and any remaining native remnants, as well as grasslands that are in poor condition. So the grass exists, but it's not in very good condition. And how can we um, identify those areas to improve management there? The kinds of decisions that they were looking at uh, were linking to NRCS funding opportunities. So programs like we heard about earlier in the new farm bill. How do we link to those and make that money go further? Determining it, whether or not those management practices that have already been put in place, like prescribed fire, are actually working. Are they getting the results that they want to see? And the cross timbers area, one of the key things that came out of this workshop was really just better information on who else is working there. What kind of projects are they doing? What's their focus? And one of the suggested, uh, a couple suggested pilot project areas came out of that. Um, one was the northern part of the Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture Priority Areas, so uh, southern Oklahoma and northern Texas, as well as discussion about the Deep, the Deep Fork Wildlife Refuge. So those are a couple of the areas that came out of there. And, and really, as we've talked about over the last couple days, you know, the Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture and those partners at RCS, um, they were the, the main folks who were who were there in Oklahoma City, as well as ODWC, who starting to do a lot more work on, especially on their rep, uh, state wildlife areas. And what did you say ODWC stands for? Oh, Oklahoma Department <coughs> of Wildlife Conservation. Okay. Sorry, I, I have lots of acronyms. So yeah. Oh, you said it earlier. <laughs> Uh, we moved to the Austin workshop on the 8th of May, and we had about 30 people in attendance at that one, so it was uh, we had a really good uh, turnout for it. Uh, what came up in terms of grassland type there, we went really quickly away from sort of defining habitat, because that means sort of different things to different people, but more talking about grassland types, and really the three things came up. Uh, the size of the patch, the structure of it, so what's it actually look like in terms of mix of woody vegetation and, and then the species. Species in this case being the linkage to wildlife species primarily, um, some of the avian species. Uh, there was a lot of emphasis at that workshop that all grasslands are important and they're all under stress in Texas. Drought comes up of course, urbanization, expansion of energy, the energy industry, all of those things. Very, uh, very important. And then the grassland decisions we're really where to direct funding. So we have money in some cases, where should we put it? Where's the greatest return on that investment? Uh, again, the impact on priority or focal species, including grassland birds, how do we know what we're doing is getting the result that we want? And then we talked a lot about receptive communities. Uh, it's been mentioned several times here in the last couple days, Texas is 95% privately owned. If you don't have a community that's willing to work with you, you can have all the pretty maps in the world and you're still not going to get um, 
what you need to have happen on the landscape. And a lot of we had a lot of delivery conservation program delivery people in that session, and they talked about some of the differences between communities, and they're pretty um, distinct in some cases. One of the pilot project areas uh, that we quickly gelled on in this workshop was the southern focus area for the Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture um, for their GRIP program. So where that red circle is and that, so that I think they call it their, yeah, their Southeast OPJV uh, Priority Program. In part because there's a lot of work going on there. There's lots of partners looking at things like uh, focal species and uh, and the OPJB work that's going on. So that came up pretty quickly as the priority, uh, a potential pilot project area. We moved the next week to Kingsville, which is an, again an entirely different sort of uh, workshop. It was interesting. I, I attended three of the four workshops, and they're all very, they were all very different, but they all had some real similarities as well. So it was interesting to go and hear. What, to, what the people across the region, uh, their differences and their similarities. So, and in terms of grassland types here, we talked about the, the coastal sand plain, the town of Lipa and grassland bird habitat. So the Rio Grande joint venture that I mentioned, they're starting to look at identifying their own focal areas in that uh, southern part of the valley. And then the, we talked about the Angleside sand sheet as well. Grassland decisions that we're looking at, here are about enhancing connectivity and where best to provide incentives, both in terms of willingness of the landowner and efficiency. So if you had one dollar to spend on conservation, where would you put that dollar? And we talked about outreach and demonstration locations as well. And as some of you will be familiar with this area of the country large, there's large landowners, large ranches. How can we get people out and, and have demonstration sites to show them what can be done in terms of grassland conservation in those regions. But this was the one where we talked a lot about the incentives and the efficiency of that conservation dollar. So how do you know that what you're spending money on is getting the return that you want? Do you know, how do you know if you're paying too much? How do you know if you're paying too little? Does it matter what kind of incentive you provide and how you provide it? And uh, we had a really good discussion on that with this workshop. And then the pilot project area that came up was uh, the South Texas Plains west of Highway 77. And they talked about a fairly big area, um, parts of I think nine counties uh, we're looking at. And, and that's where a lot of those big ranches are. And then uh, we ended up in Lafayette. Uh, Chris Reed was there uh, at that workshop and there's there's several people over the last few days I've seen who were at various workshops uh, for this. In Lafayette, we talked primarily about really looking at the mosaic of pasture rangeland and improved pasture. So there's uh, Louisiana, coastal Louisiana, especially is not, there's not a lot of large patches of prairie left. It's really about that mosaic. So how can we improve the uh, plowed prairie that's been in hay production or cattle uh, forage for a long time? to sort of complement the existing uh, prairie remnants that some of which they're just sort of discovering exist again. Uh, grassland decisions, pretty simple, uh, simple in terms of we came to conclusion quickly, it's really about where to acquire land, where to restore it, and where to manage it. And the pilot project area that came out of the discussion here was the Chenier Plains. So or Southeast Louisiana, um, Southeast Texas, Calcasieu and Cameron parishes, and then potentially moving into Jefferson and, and Chambers parishes, and potentially across just into Texas across the city. Coastal Prairie, yeah, it looks a little different. So those workshops, as I mentioned, were just uh, wrapped up. We actually had a conference call yesterday with the principal investigators to talk about the sort of the summary of what we heard and our next steps. So really what we need to do next is establish the overall work plan. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking to partners at the beginning of this project because we want to develop decision support tools that people are actually going to use. There's decision support tools out there for lots of different things, but they're on someone's computer or you need to have 
you know, a master's in GIS to run them, and those don't really help most most people, especially smaller organizations and NGOs who just don't have, might not have their own GIS person. So we wanted to spend that time and really get to people, hear people what they wanted and and what they were going to use it for. Uh, we need to also determine the pilot project areas. We've got uh, funding within the project for, we think, two pilot project areas, and so we've been discussing some options on that, and if there's interest in expanding that, how we could bring money into the project to have three or four pilot project areas. We're also collecting uh, maps from many of the people who were there, outlining their current uh, locations of their priority grassland types or their focal areas, so that we can start to build that uh, where people are working across the region. The spatial analysis component of it, which is Dave, Dave Diamond out of MORAP, that's his uh, area of expertise. That will be done after, uh, after we get all the maps and the priority areas identified. And then we'll begin to develop the decision support toolkit. And that could include things like uh, static maps. At some, it's for some people, uh, we talked a lot about maps and what kind of maps you would want to have, as well as software tools, so options to increase, to put in your own information and to have some flexibility on what you kind of decisions you want to make. The project is scheduled for completion uh, next summer, so we've got a ways to go on it, but it's been a really good uh, experience and hopefully we'll provide the partners, a lot of the partners within the LCC, what they need to do. Uh, they need to make better informed decisions for their own conservation efforts. And, and hopefully all of this will be housed on the conservation planning atlas that I showed earlier. That's the intent, uh, at least. So there'll be lots of um, opportunity for people to use those tools once they get up and running. So as Bill mentioned it, er, earlier, the LCC is really about adding value. Um, we don't want to duplicate efforts. We aren't like a a replacement for some of the ongoing existing partnerships like the joint ventures and the fish habitat partnerships. It's really about serving as a catalyst to bring those things together. Um, the ability for us to, uh, within the partnership and the USGS in Lafayette, to store and provide access to the data and the mapping products has been a real uh, benefit. We've started to put together that information and trying to make it as accessible as we can to people so that it actually gets used. Uh, we're looking at uh, multiple partners and strategic habitat conservation for multiple species. So if you have an aquatic species in an area like the Edwards Plateau, for example, and then you've got black cap vireo and golden cheap warbler, how can we sort of stack those things so that we can identify conservation hotspots? So where conservation investment is, uh, has the highest return. And then getting land managers to contribute to, to SHC objectives, so str strategic habitat conservation objectives, and enabling them to, do, uh, to make a living from that land. And this gets to the relationship with private landowners. Mm -hmm. How are you going to address the privacy issues with the private landowners? I think that's, that's going to depend on which program it, it we're looking at. And that's why in the CPA there's going to be um, some data that can't be, you could get it at a county level but no finer than that, for example, on some of the programs. Um, and we're starting to have more sort of dedicated discussions with private landowners and talking to them about some of their privacy concerns as, as well. We had a someone from the East Foundation at the, at the workshop in Kingsville, for example. Those are, those are serious things that we'll need to talk about and we'll have to protect that data and what goes into it. And it gets to some of the information just won't be available at anything lower than a county level. So, um, starting to talk to land managers, big land, large land managers and small land managers, um, across the LCC about how their management can help contribute to this and, and enable them to make a living from the land. Fire's been uh, discussed several times over the last uh, few days and will no doubt continue to be a big 
a topic of discussion. I think this is the, the global average temperature expectations, so it's going to get hotter and drier and rain's going to come in different patterns than we've seen in the past, and how's that going to affect our ability to conserve grasslands? One of the things we're doing at our upcoming steering committee meeting in Oklahoma, just north of Oklahoma City in June, is talking about the human dimensions the science needs around things like fire. So what are the barriers to having more fire on the landscape? So people's fear of fire, right? We've suppressed fire for so long. What do we need to do now to get over that and to have people more accepting of fire and to better understand the role that it plays in, in grassland conservation? So we've got a special session at our upcoming steering committee meeting where we're bringing in uh, two economists, one from Texas A&M and one from Colorado, who work on uh, motivators, so drivers of conservation programs, including prescribed burning, as well as a sociologist from OSU who's going to talk about some of the cultural aspects of, of fire. And this is a really big issue for many of our partners, is how do you get uh, conservation programs on the ground? We know what we need for the animals, we know we we can hypothesize what those land use changes are going to be, but if you can't get it on the ground, we're, we're dead in the water. So this is a special session uh, designed to sort of get us more comfortable with using economics and sociology to address conservation issues. These are just some slides Bill put in from uh, Texas. We talked a lot um, in the Kingsville workshop about wind energy, of course, in that Corpus Christi area, as well as some of the other areas we've talked about lately, and the energy industry overall and the impact it's having on grasslands. This is right at the edge of our LCC, the Ozark Glades in Oklahoma, in the prairie. And I had to throw this in. This is from the, this is taken in 2011 on the farm I used to live in in Saskatchewan. So I had to throw in a Saskatchewan picture of, <laughs> of my cattle. <laughs> so, um, are there any other questions? That was all I had, Bill. Unless you had something else to add. Do you have anything else you wanted? To no, I, I think I think some of those issues that we're talking about, whether it's fire or where to locate.